Hello again, everyone, and welcome back. Now, I'm really excited for today's video because what I'm going to do is give you a tour of my studio. Now, I've given you a tour of my studio in the past, but it's changed quite a bit, and actually, I've remodeled it recently. And ever since I showed you guys some photos on Twitter of the new office after remodeling it, you guys have asked me for a new studio tour video, so that's what I'm going to give you in this video. But before we get into that, what I'd like to do is give you a retrospective of what the office looked like over various stages of its development. And it might even be a little hard to believe that each of the photos that I'm about to show you have been taken from the same room. But actually, they were. Now the photo that you are seeing right now is the most current iteration of my studio prior to the remodeling. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like now. I can't believe the difference, and honestly, it's hard to believe that every photo I've shown you is of the same room. The newest version doesn't look like the same room at all. So let's take a look around. The first thing that I'll mention is that my studio is essentially two different halves, each one representing one of my two biggest hobbies. The technology half is what you see in each video. That's where my desk, computer, servers, and recording gear is. The other half is dedicated to classic gaming. There's also a hint of modern gaming thrown in, but for the most part is dedicated to the classics. And although you can't see my entire retro game collection here, and that makes sense considering that it would never fit in the studio, I have over 30 working game consoles in my collection, and that collection also contains over 1,100 physical games. So let's first take a look at the technology half of the office. And also what I'll do whenever possible is give you guys affiliate links if you want to buy any of the things that I have here in the office. Now I do earn revenue from those links, but you're also supporting Learn Linux TV if you do order from one of those links. So if anything that I have is something that you wanted to buy anyway, well, you could buy it and help support the channel. But anyway, let's check out the technology side of the office. And let's start with the desk. The desk I'm using is actually intended for office buildings, so it's actually a bit on the pricey side. But I wanted something very durable, and durable it definitely is. In fact, it's so heavy that repositioning it in the slightest way is very tedious. But the benefit is, again, that it's solid. I decided to go with a U-shaped desk because I felt like that would be the easiest way to record YouTube videos. I have a dedicated side of the desk that's there for addressing the camera, but then I also have a dedicated place for my display, keyboard, as well as the various computers and things that I have on my desk. If you're curious about who made this particular desk, it was made by Bush Furniture, and I will have an affiliate link down below. As part of the recent remodeling, the walls near my desk I had converted into accent walls, which I think give it a little extra character, and also that fits in with the wood grain theme of my entire office. Now a lot of people assume that the accent walls have soundproofing, which is actually not the case. And the reason why I didn't include soundproofing on that side of the room is that there's just no need for it there. Anytime I'm recording, my voice is traveling away from those walls anyway. So in case you were wondering, that's why there's no soundproofing on that side of the room. When it comes to my display, the display that I use is made by AOC. It's an ultra-wide display, as you can see here, and the model and specs are being shown on the screen right now. And having an ultra-wide display like this one really makes editing a breeze. I love it. Now, one thing that you're not seeing right here are monitor cables. As for me, I actually hate all kinds of cables all over the place, so what I decided to do was route the cables through the wall. I think that's ultimately the best way to hide monitor cables. And it also makes everything look a lot cleaner. When it comes to the keyboard, I'm still using the launch keyboard made by System76, the same one that I reviewed a while back. It's a fantastic keyboard, and I highly recommend it. Now, before anyone mentions the lack of a numpad, it doesn't bother me personally, but System76 is coming out with a version that does have a numpad, so if you wait a little longer, then you could definitely buy one with a numpad. 
and depending on when you are watching this video, it might already be out. Now, the only thing that I don't like about the launch keyboard is that it's not wireless. It probably can't be wireless anyway because it has a built-in USB hub. But I also didn't want cables stretched across the desk either, so I decided to drill a hole right in the desk and is partially hidden by the large mouse pad that sits underneath the keyboard and the mouse itself. So that way I was able to keep the cabling clean even with the wired keyboard. Now I often get a lot of questions about the speakers, people asking me what kind of speakers they are, who made them, and actually what I'm going to do right now is show you the details of these speakers right here on the screen. What I love most about these speakers is that they're very great for editing video because the quality is so clear that it makes it easy to find any audio imperfections that may sometimes sneak into my footage. These speakers also have multiple inputs, so it's easy to connect multiple devices. For example, there's Bluetooth support as well as two standard PC inputs. So yeah, I highly recommend these speakers. They're great. Now in case you are wondering about the lamps that you see in the background of my videos, these are actually made by a pair of artists that often display their work in local art shows. I'm absolutely obsessed with these lamps. I love them so much. So definitely check out these lamps. I highly recommend them. I mean, just look at these. They're beautiful. I'll leave some information on the screen right now where you can visit the artist's website if you want to check these out. Anyway, continuing along, behind me I have my Turing Pi 2 build, which is actually an ITX compatible board that's able to support four Raspberry Pi compute modules and also the NVIDIA Jetson as well. In mine, I have four CM4s and each one has a special role. Well, the first three do anyway. One of them is used as a utility server for various controls and monitoring that I have set up. Another is used for development. And I even have a dedicated CM4 to record screen capture from. The fourth one doesn't yet have a use case, but I'll set up something on that as soon as possible. Now the majority of the controls in the office is controllable through Home Assistant, something that I have set up. I've reviewed the Home Assistant Blue some time ago, and I'm still using it. And Home Assistant gives me quick access to lighting as well as the ability to turn on the recording PC and televisions right from the panel that you see right here. Now when it comes to the camera, I can't actually add that to Home Assistant unfortunately, so there's a few things that are not controlled by Home Assistant, but most things are. If you haven't checked out Home Assistant yet, then I highly recommend that you do. Home automation is a lot of fun. Next, let's address the elephant in the room. And by elephant, I mean the large size desktop that you see right here. And that's my Thelio desktop made by System76. Specifically, this is the Thelio Major. They've actually refreshed this desktop very recently, so new ones won't look exactly the same as this one, but it's pretty much the same idea. This PC currently has 64 gigabytes of RAM, an AMD Threadripper CPU, and also an NVIDIA 3090 GPU. It also has over four terabytes of storage between multiple SSDs, as well as a 10 gigabit ethernet connection, so that way I can edit video directly from my file server without having to copy everything over before I start editing. And then on top of the tower, I get a lot of questions about what that robot is right there, and that's actually my automated assistant, Mycroft. Mycroft, why don't you say hello? Hello. So what I've done so far is I've gone over some of the things that you see in the background of basically every video. But let's go ahead and look around the room a bit, and I'll show you things that you normally don't see in the videos. In front of me is the Sony ZV-1 camera, which is what I use anytime you see me in the footage. This camera can produce some amazing results, but the menu, unfortunately, is a bit on the annoying side, to be honest. It's not so bad if you spend some time tuning it and then you write down all the settings that you use in case you forget what you did, but I do have to warn you that menus are annoying. But once you get past that, it's definitely a great camera. Above the camera is a standard 4K television, which helps me monitor whatever I'm recording. This is hooked up to the same recording PC I built a while back, which has an NVIDIA GPU as well as two capture cards. One of these capture cards is dedicated to the ZV-1, with the other one dedicated to capturing footage from laptops and desktops. That capture card is hooked up to an HDMI cloner, which also places the same image on my smaller display as well, which is right in front of me as I record footage. So anytime I record screen captures, I just pull this display right into place. That way I can see up close what I'm going to be recording, and then when I'm done, I simply push it out of the frame. Just like that. Continuing, below the TV and camera, you can see some of my audio setup, which currently uses the Go XLR, but I might switch back to my channel strip, which you can see right below that. I think the audio quality is probably good enough, but I might play around with it, but then again, I might just leave it alone. I think it's probably fine as it is. Now when it comes to the microphone, the microphone that I use for recording is made by Audio-Technica, 
It's a hypercardioid condenser mic, which definitely helps delete background noise while also being able to capture my voice quite well. So that's about it when it comes to the technology side of the office. Now let's go over and check out the gaming side of the office. The gaming side consists of mostly retro games, but there's some modern gaming thrown in here and there. Now I have many more consoles in my collection that are not actually in this room, but I do hook up some of those to other TVs around the house. In addition to that, I also have several retro pies that I've built as well, which I use whenever I want to quickly launch a game without going through my storage area, which is where the majority of my collection actually is. But anyway, what you can see right here are several different gaming systems. For example, I have the Sega CDX, Sega 32X, Atari Jaguar, a modded Nintendo 64, modded with HDMI, which is really cool, the Sega Dreamcast, because, well, you have to have a Sega Dreamcast if you are at all crazy about retro gaming. I mean, that's one of the best retro gaming systems that were ever created. In addition to that, I also have a few consoles made by Analog, which you can see right here. They make some awesome systems that give you the best possible picture when it comes to playing the classics. They can be a little hard to get a hold of, but if you have the opportunity to get one of their consoles, I highly recommend it. I also have two display cases in the office, and the one that you're seeing right here contains some of my favorite items in my collection. These aren't necessarily the most valuable items in my collection, but each of these have some sort of meaning to me, so that's why they're here in this case. The other case contains some of the games that I prefer to have quick access to for whatever reason. These are some of the games that I enjoy the most. I'm sure you might be wondering about my server rack here in the studio, which is actually right next to my desk. As you can see, it's a wooden rack, so it fits in fairly well with the rest of the furniture. Now, I get asked every now and then by some of my viewers for a link, so that way they could check out this rack. However, you won't find a referral link for this item in the description down below. And it's not like I can't give you a link to its product page, I'm actually refusing to do so. Reason being, if I offer you a link to this rack, you might buy one. And I could even make some serious profit if you do so. But I actually don't want you to buy it. It's expensive and very cheaply made. You'd probably regret buying it. As it is already, I have to be super careful with this rack so it doesn't practically fall apart. So rather than sell you this particular rack, I'm going to recommend that you look around and find a better one. But it's not what's on the outside that counts. Let's talk about what's inside the rack. At the top, you can see my 3D printed Raspberry Pi mount that actually supports 12 Raspberry Pis. And as you can see, each slot is populated. In case you were wondering, I purchased all of these Raspberry Pi units before the prices went up, so I know for some of you, you might have been a little bit surprised to see so many Raspberry Pis nowadays considering the price gouging, but these were actually purchased before the pandemic. Anyway, there's no power cords running to each of these Pis. I have them set up with power over Ethernet, and the Unify switch right below it supports PoE, so I only have one cable to connect for power as well as data. And that certainly helps keep the number of cables down. This particular Raspberry Pi implementation is actually a Kubernetes cluster. I've uploaded several videos in the past where I went over the process of building Kubernetes clusters, and I even have some videos that covers doing so on Raspberry Pis, so if you're curious about that, I'll leave a card for one of those videos right about here. The second switch that you see here is a 10 gigabit switch, and this is what my desktop connects to. I have a TrueNAS server for storage and a Proxmox cluster for virtualization, but those servers aren't actually pictured here, they're in another room. The reason why I mentioned those is because if I didn't, then people that have followed this channel that know that I have those servers would probably ask me where they are. Well, they're in another room, not in this particular rack. Anyway, there's a long fiber cable that actually goes all the way to that room and connects to yet another 10 gigabit switch. It's the same model as this one. And the TrueNAS and Proxmox servers are connected to that other switch, so considering that I have a 10 gigabit connection to a 10 gigabit switch that's connected to those servers also via 10 gigabit, then I have some very fast transfer capabilities between the servers. But what this allows me to do is edit video content directly off the TrueNAS server, since the 10 gigabit connection is more than fast enough to make the editing process feel almost, if not the same, as if the files were on the local hard drive. So that really helps my workflow quite a bit. Anyway, continuing, below that switch we see a fairly large server that's currently powered off. And that's my game streaming server, something that I built a while back in another video. I only power it on whenever I actually intend on playing games with it, and I haven't had a chance to play any games on it lately, so it's been powered off for a little while. 
On the bottom, we have my UPS, which actually needs some attention. The battery is, well, dead, and I haven't gotten around to replacing it. I'm going to do so soon, but the only reason I haven't done so yet is because nothing in this rack is super critical. If I lose connectivity, that would be tedious, but not the end of the world. I will replace the battery though, but I mentioned it because I know some of you guys will totally notice the error message that's showing on the display. I mentioned earlier that I have other servers in the house, namely my Proxmox and TrueNAS servers, but I'm not going to show you those in this video because I might actually make a dedicated home lab tour video that goes over my config in greater detail. If I do, I think that would be a more appropriate video for showing the TrueNAS and Proxmox servers anyway. But when it comes to the rack here in my studio, the primary purpose is for the Kubernetes cluster. Now you might think that it can get a little lonely here in the studio recording videos by myself, but I actually have company every single day. And that company is Riley, the three-toed box turtle. She lives here in the studio with me. I actually got her when she was a hatchling and she's, well, just two years old right now. And these turtles can take as long as 12 years to become fully grown. So she's going to be small for a little while, but then again, her species isn't the largest even when they are fully grown. Now I say she, I'm not sure if this is a male or a female. I should find out fairly soon as she grows older, it becomes easier to tell the difference. I also have some aquatic turtles as well, which are further down the hall. So they're not part of the studio, but I figured they were worth a mention since I brought up Riley. I have these turtles in 110 gallon stock tanks, so they actually have a lot of room to swim. So there you go. You guys have been asking for an updated tour of my studio, and that's what I just gave you. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider clicking that like button, which also helps YouTube understand that you like this video, and that in turn helps me out as well. Anyway, I have some very awesome content coming very soon, so definitely subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I'll see you in the next video.